Hi, welcome to the session uh, Voting Rights and the Advancement of Democracy in the Pan-African Communities. I'm Wiza Muntali, your host, the uh, moderator today. I'm with the uh, Africa Will Now Project, and I'm also with Africa Now. I'm host of Africa Now on WPFW 89.3 FM in Washington, D.C. And I also want to just to introduce you to the um, session that we're having today. We're looking at the, the Pan-African communities in Africa, the Americas, and Europe, um, who are threatened by global and domestic forces of anti-democratic radicalized assaults on voting rights, human rights, and uh, white nationalism, including places like Ukraine. And Ukraine has, has exposed this in particular. Uh, the recent US presidential summit on democracy with African leaders uh, focused on, on democratic reforms in Africa. The workshop will offer a comprehend, uh, comparative lens on these questions and recommended advocacy que actions to the African Union through its US office and promote advocacy with voting rights in the US regarding Africans in the African diaspora community, African, uh, Africans in the diaspora communities. First, I just want to introduce the uh, panelists today. Um, uh, Reverend Frank Chikani, who is a former anti-apartheid leader of the United Democratic Front in South Africa and currently the moderator of the Commission of the Churches uh, on International Affairs, World Council of Churches. Uh, first, uh, Reverend Frank Chikani is, is an emeritus pastor of the Apostolic Faith Mission in South Africa. He is also a convener of the African and African Diaspora Conference together with Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith and one of the leaders of Defend Our Democracy campaign in South Africa. And uh, he has been part of also the, um, uh, he's been, he served as an influential member of uh, the South African Council of Churches, being its uh, um, general secretary as well as vice president and also served in the presidencies of uh, Mr. Nelson Mandela and uh, Thabo Mbeke earlier. And I could go on for the rest of the, sh the, the program of all the things that he's done, but I think I'll end there because that's, we only have a limited time. And also joining us is uh, attorney Marcia Johnson Blanco. She is a co-director of the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law. Uh, she manages the project's uh, voter engagement programs and advocacy portfolios, which include overseeing the work of the election protection, uh, the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection uh, coalition. And she coordinates the Lawyers Committee's international human rights initiatives, including monitoring US compliance with its treaty obligations under the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Just as uh, Reverend Chikani, she is a major force in human rights, civil rights all around the world. And you probably have seen her on Al Jazeera's uh, Democracy Maybe uh, series, uh, uh, which it was played. I, I remember seeing it when I was in Malawi recently. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show. And she's also an adjunct, adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown University. And uh, also today with us is uh, Adote Akwe. He's the Chief Collaboration Officer at Amnesty International. He rejoined Amnesty International USA in September 2020 after serving as a Senior Policy Advisor at CARE USA. Before joining CARE, Adote worked with Amnesty International USA for 11 years, first as Senior Advocacy Director for Africa and then later as a Director. Prior to that, Adote served as the Africa Director for Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, which is now um, Human Rights First. And prior to that, he worked with the uh, American Committee in Africa and, and the Africa Fund as Human, as human Rights Director. And Adote is uh, an experienced advocate and campaigner on civil, political, and economic social rights, U.S. foreign policy and security policy, as well as rights-based approach in ending poverty in the field of experience of Africa and Asia. Thank you very much for uh, for being on the program, Adote. And uh, as you can see, we have a full uh, fledged, critical, important panels. And we're going to start with uh, um, 
Marcia Johnson Blanco, who who began us looking at uh, the issue uh, from uh, comparative lens, from the international and domestic lens as well. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, share my perspective on uh, voting, the state of voting rights in the U.S. today and how we can um, engage and learn from each other. So um, the US right now is what I would say in a crisis for democracy. We uh, had an historic election in uh, 2020 for the, the presidential election where we saw unprecedented, unprecedented turnout and that turnout was fueled by opportunities to vote before election day that um, states put in place because of the uh, pandemic. And so we saw 100 million people voting before the general election day um, using early voting or vote by mail um, to be able to vote. So there was a significant turnout um, before the official election day um, for the first time. But we also saw an unprecedented challenge to the outcome of the election that's still reverberating um, in the country. Um, as you are all aware, um, first, there were challenges to the vote in um, states across the country. And significantly, the challenges were to the votes of minority voters, African-American voters. So. There were challenges to the votes in Atlanta, challenges to the votes in Detroit, in Philadelphia, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. These are all cities with significant minority populations. And then President Trump challenged the vo those votes um, as he contested the outcome of the election. Those challenges were unsuccessful. And then we saw the insurrection that happened um, in on January 6th. Um, 2021 that's still reverberating right now and um we're you know as a nation coming to terms with the insurrection and um its significance but at the same time what we we've seen is in states um such as texas georgia and florida though they um those legislatures have passed laws that make it harder to vote. They looked at the ways that people voted that uh, contributed to the significant uh, turnout in uh, 2020, and they're targeting those methods of voting, the vote by mail methods, the ability to um, drop your um, ballot to the drop box, the ability to support voters who have to wait in hours long lines in order to be able to vote. They either targeted um, all of those um, opportunities. They've also um, targeted the role of election officials and how they can um, support voters. Um, for example, in Texas, um, election officials um, can be criminally charged if they try to stop poll, work, poll watchers from approaching voters in an, in an aggressive manner. In Georgia, we've seen election officials who've been removed back from election boards and replaced with um, partisan officials. And at, as all of this backlash is happening to um, the 2020 election, we are also seeing um, a weakening, a continued weakening of our voting laws. So in 2023, the Supreme Court significantly weakened the iconic Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I argue that it's because of the Voting Rights Act, that's when democracy really began in America, because before that, there was really strict, severe discrimination against African Americans and other people, other people of color in this country and stopping our ability to be able to vote. That was overcome. Um, by the passage of the Voting Rights Act. But that act has been significantly weakened um, by the Supreme Court. And since 2013, advocates like myself and others have been trying to get Congress to restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act and have been 
continually unsuccessful in those attempts. And we saw again um, in January of this year, we couldn't even get a debate um, on the floor of the Senate to show why the Voting Rights Act needed to be fixed because of the Senate rules that prevented um, such a debate from happening. So we are in a heightened, um, polit polarized, politically polarized environment currently. And we have uh, the directed efforts by states and others to undermine the ability for um, voters of color to be able to vote. So what do we do about it? Um, we have been working in the courts. Um, my organization, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, is challenging um, the laws passed by Texas and Georgia. Others are challenging laws um, passed um, by other states. Um, we will continue to do our advocacy before the Congress and also before state legislatures to push back against barriers to vote, but also to advocate for reforms that will ensure that eligible voters um, have access to the ballot. And we're also doing a tremendous amount of voter education because the voting laws have been changing after every election. We want to make sure that voters are aware of uh, and have the information that they need in order to cast a ballot that counts and that they're not deterred because of these barriers and they feel supported. Um, it, when they go um, to cast the ballot. And I do, you know, from a Pan-African perspective, I do feel that, um, you know, the U.S., we hold ourselves up to be a exemplar democracy, but I think the reality is that we're seeing right now is that we're not. And we have a lot to learn um, from others and I do see, you know, there are two um, significant forums that have come up recently that would allow for the sharing and, and learning from each other. Um, one I would say is the um, International Forum of People of African Descent that has been um, newly constituted, um, provides a way for um, those of us of African descent here in the United States to um, meet with others um, across the world in the diaspora to learn and talk to each other about how um, we can lift up and protect um, voting rights and democracy. And then um, we had the convening of the uh, summit, um, the summit for democracy here in the US um, in December. Interestingly, that summit was very outward looking. <laughs> there wasn't really significant engagement internally. And um, you know the way it was structured and organized through the US State Department and USAID, those are agencies that do not look internally, but we, there's another summit um, coming up in, in December. And you know those of us who are advocates here in the US have been pushing back and saying, you know, we need to be part of that conversation. <laughs> it's not just what the world needs to do. But clearly, we have a lot of work to do internally. And so I do think, you know, that, um, you know, we're fighting to ensure that that forum also offers us an opportunity to have a, a global and uh, pan-African um, conversation as well. So um, I will stop there. <laughs> um, but um, just wanted to give a very quick and brief overview of the unfortunate state of affairs with voting rights and democracy currently here in the U.S. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Monsieur Johnson Blanco, for um, providing us that um, the context, the environment in uh, the U.S. as it connects to the rest of the world in the, the field of democracy and voting rights. And um, I think now we're going to go to uh, our Reverend Frank Chicani. Yes. Share my PowerPoint. Um, I just say that uh, um, I thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar. I, I thought about how one would approach this, and I'm happy that our 
speaker has dealt with the matters uh, from a U.S. perspective because I thought the, my contribution, uh, you can see it on the screen. Uh, can Yes, we can see it. Present. Yes, we can yeah. see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's it. I, I thought I would uh, deal with the issues about how racism plays into this it's about rights, freedoms, democracy, etc. And I must say that it has been to us quite a shock to observe what happened in the United States. I followed it in detail, don't understand everything, but I just felt uh, democracy was a vulnerable um, entity because if it can go wrong in the United States, then it can go wrong anywhere. So I've, I've historical perspective to just run through it. Um, it's just for my uh, myself that I mean we start from slavery, we go to colonization, we go to neocolonization. I've gone into the details of of that. I could speak to it. It's not necessary. And then the post-colonial regimes that we had to deal with in the South African context. Then I thought I must start from the First World War. And I just want to say, for me, for us, it's, it wasn't a world war. It was a European war uh, when the, where the United States got involved and all of us from the colonies got uh, dragged into it. But they talked about defending democracy, freedoms, and the rights. Uh, but with a racist perspective, because the colonized and racially discriminated, um, those who are still excluded. The World War II, as, as you know, the conference in Brussels was held. Um, and, uh, Woodrow Wilson called it, you know, make the world safe for democracy. Uh, but Du Bois and others went to try to in France. The first thing that he was told is that he can't be part of the uh, U.S. delegation uh, because the British would have a problem about that. And so we're excluded. You you drag, you get dragged into the war to to make democracy safe and for freedoms. But once it's over, you get excluded purely on racial basis. I found the Prince Faisal of Mecca uh, quite an interesting part of it because they were promised that they were going to be given that freedom and they tried to come to Vaisalas to present this. It was rejected. Even Japan at that point was also there. Those were not accepted. Then World War II came. Um, again, France, um, uh, 1945, um, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt really for freedoms, which uh, we could elaborate on, and the war happened, and when, in fact, we had to then create a new world order. We again excluded uh, Du Bois again uh, as a representative of the AA, NAACP. And we not. And I just want to say that because of that, the UN become. I, I edited this because I had said a relic of the colonial period, but I thought I must take it easy on that. But it excludes. It's not a democratic structure. It is completely because we're colonized. By the way, the apartheid system was represented at that conference, and the, the um, preamble have, um, was conducted by South Africa in an apartheid setting. But we're excluded. Veto powers are powerful, powerless, and you can continue exclusions. 
and exceptions for the powerful from complying with so the 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 powerful can choose not to be part of the Rome statutes we must be dragged into the international criminal court but they don't go there and where the court tried applied against those prosecutors as you would know it happened just recently then there are unilateral violations of rights and unilateral actions uh, those who are powerful can do it unilateral and therefore they are not powerful then become losers in it and so in this world justice is divisible as opposed to what Martin Luther King called justice is indivisible. Um, uh, once you make it divisible, it means that others don't get justice, but some do, and power then becomes a word there. Security also, it's, it's divisible instead of equal and indivisible security for all. The, the less powerful cannot say i need security but those who are powerful can rights are also unequal um, um and i thought i must just refer to the u.s presidential summit which um, was held recently and african leaders were there the efforts are great but you'll remember that there was a bit of challenges about other people not coming to attend others at us excluded and i just want to say that in this world we dis we described earlier we need to move beyond and this is my proposal our narrow national interests in the world geopolitical interest to the common good of all humanity once we do that it means justice for all and therefore participation in elections as europe was talking democracy they were oppressing us and you, you become a victim so in 1948 manchester pan-african congress con conference the pan-african did a mapping of a way forward irrespective of the powerful and against the odds that's when you begin to get the in movements that then become Ghana becomes free and others. I won't speak about that because the history is known. But then the reality on the continent and developing countries, hard experiments were done on democratic systems and governance, but there were neo-colonial systems, dictatorships, client states and proxy states. I mean, you just have to go to West Africa and their relationship with France. Um, it still bamboozles me up to date that in their budgets and, and fund finances were done from France and they put their money there. The details are known. And actually, France can fly in without permission of the government in that country and do whatever they can. So you had neo-colonial systems, the freedoms were not complete and, and, and uh, people didn't have full rights. We came with the AU Constitution, Constitutive Act. I happened to have been involved in government at that time and try to guarantee democracy, good governance and rights um, on the continent. Struggle um um uh, elections are vulnerable some are stolen and corrupted and we are dealing with but i thought i will end with the case of south africa because and the current struggle for liberation everybody talks about it and we're supported the international community, the anti-apartheid movement, not the government. Uh, the, the Western world supported apartheid up to the last days. And 
and and assisted them to have nuclear weapons, um, uh, nuclear weapons, arsenals, uh, chemical weapons, when it is it suits them and it's they break all the rules in the world. Uh, we have one of the best constitutions in the world to protect the rights of people because our rights were so violated. Great effort to create an ideal, just and society. Challenges. The challenges are in the economy. That's what we are facing. And that's what will undo our democracy. Corruption setting in. And some of you would have been following that we had to have a commission on state capture where the corrupt uh, in, in, uh, line up with the underworld of criminality um, to dictate who even becomes your leader. And that takes away your freedom. Even if you, your vote can also be, if you've got corrupted leaders, they will also corrupt the elections. And this is what I call the threat to our democracy, um, which we are dealing with at the present moment. We have got all the rights to go and vote, but our fear now is that people will soon even interfere with the electoral processes. And, and it's, it's a different perspective from outside the United States, but I believe that the issues as, as similar. So we, we then formed a Defend Our Democracy campaign last year when the former president decided he's going to operate outside the law, ignore the courts, walk away from courts. And as you know, he got charged. Um, and, and when he went into prison, we had a um, failed insurrection and 350 people died. Um, uh, it was contained. So there is a threat to our democracy, even if we have all the rights uh, to vote. So our campaign is to deepen and defend our democracy and calling on the people. That's what we did last year. Call on the people defend our democracy against all the odds. Um, and we are planning for a conference uh, in June, July on democratic renewal and change as a nation to say, how are we going to make sure that our democratic uh, gains are not reversed by corrupt, compromised, and people who are linked with the underworld to sabotage our democracy. I thought I must present that and leave it for a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend uh, Chikani, for that eloquent uh, uh, description of the, the challenges uh, in the international community, as well as uh, specifically in South Africa today uh, and democracy and voting rights. Uh, next, we're going to go to um, Adote Akwe of Amnesty International USA. Thank you. Uh, Muiza, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so, as uh, Muisa said, I work for a rights group, and um, normally we don't talk to or address voting and democracy issues because uh, we believe that rights transcend the type of government, uh, whether they be military juntas or monarchies. There's a fundamental obligation to protect, uphold, and promote the rights of individuals. So um, I, uh, today I hope that you'll take my comments as my personal reflections and uh, not as anything official from Amnesty. Um, I want to say that I, I think one of the things at the core of our discussion here today is this issue of political freedom um, and that political freedom is a fundamental right. Uh, and more importantly, for a discussion of Pan-Africa, I, I, uh, the Pan-African community, it's important to realize that this quest for the fundamental right has been a keystone um, and is actually the reason or the driving reason for the struggle to end colonialism and become politically free. And I think that there's a um, there's been an unfortunate uh, failure to continue to demand 
political freedom and democracy for the individuals as completely derived from the colonial struggle, um, which we need to sort of revive, because that I think is one of the most powerful arguments. Um, I think we, uh, the Marcia already shared the regression or you know the the reversals um, in uh, the United States, and it was interesting to remember that. Um, you know, just uh, before the, um, the the 2020 election, the, his, the when we spoke about historical elections in the United States, we were actually probably referring to the Obama elections. And yet here we were um, not only with an election that was contested, but that there was actually a violent attempt to try to overturn the results. There's a, been a global reverse of fundamental rights. There's been a global crackdown on civic space. Uh, and democratically elected and accountable governments. This is a trend that is not only in the United States, it's in Africa, and it's certainly happening in, in the Americas and in Asia. It's a global phenomenon, and um, it, it shows up either in the rise of populist governments that are incredibly intolerant and are comfortable discriminating and identifying quote-unquote problematic people and problematic practices and wiping them away, or even their reneging of um, obligations uh, that were treaty uh, to their treaty obligations. In, in Africa in 2021, um, there were familiar um, human rights concerns that I think all play into the struggle around voting and the exercise of true democracy. The first one is the continued the continuation of conflicts in so many places. And while some people may think only of, um, of full-blown battles in, say, um, the D parts of the DRC, or uh, sadly what happened um, in Ethiopia between the Tigrayan regional government and the federal government, but you're also talking about conflict in inside countries between armed groups and the government, which in the end not only destroys livelihoods and economies, but displaces people and, and, and is, of course, the site of massive human rights abuse by the armed groups as well as by the government forces. Um, you have unlawful attacks, in other words, attacks against civilians and attacks against um, organizations that are providing humanitarian relief or medical care. Um, in addition to conflict, you also, of course, had the repression of dissent. Um, this is again sometimes termed as closing civic space, but this is where your, gen your your journalists are arrested. This is when your magazines or your newspapers are closed. This is when governments use legislation um, or try to pass legislation that um, criminalizes um, uh, uh, investigations or publications around the dis the distribution of COVID nineteen vaccines or um, questions the decision making of government. You also have crackdowns on protests, nonviolent protests. I think all of us remember um, the NSARS protests that happened in Nigeria, where peaceful protesters were um, uh, trying to demand accountability for a police force that had been disbanded by President Buhari, but had been disbanded without any accountability um, uh, after an appalling record of uh, uh, use of extrajudicial force, bribery, um, uh, disappearances. Um, the SARS unit was 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 notorious, and yet the protesters were not only shot at; they were then arrested and hunted down as agitators. Um, one of the key factors that continued also um, was impunity. There's no accountability because the judicial systems are weak and the political actors are linked to those um, at the very top. And uh, more importantly, the issue the, the issue of accountability for the behavior of police or military remains an aspiration. We do not have it. And there, there is a very similar type of, maybe not at the same level, but the similarities between accountability here in the United States for the, um, uh, the deaths of so many African-American men um, uh, should, 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 ring, should ring alarm bells. Um, I've already mentioned the restrictions that are placed on human rights defenders and, and around freedom of association. I think um, one, one last human rights factor that 
that is negatively impacting voting rights is the issue of discrimination, which Reverend Shikani already mentioned, um, and marginalization. And this, of course, means marginalization, say, for example, of women and their ability to compete in elections, their ability to vote, their ability to speak freely, um, uh, the ability of members of the LGBTQ community to even be considered as deserving and worthy of the same constitutional rights as the rest of the people in their country. Those are not only fundamental gaps and breakdowns for those communities, they're also terrible um, warning signs for other communities because all it takes is the government to decide, well, we have managed to illegalize a certain group of people. We can do it with another group of people. Um, and so those, the, the, the one, once you uh, let this cancer of discrimination and marginalization be embedded or entrenched and have legal back uh, constitutional uh, force, uh, the, the, the possibilities are really frightening. Um, just to sort of again review um, the trend of democracies in Africa, in 1985 there were only three democracies and, and four authoritarian regimes. This is uh, from another organization, not Amnesty. By 2015 that number of democracies had gone up to 22, but in 2020 there were only 18. The trend was going back down. Further, there have been other attempts to erode presidential term limits, which present a real risk to democracy and have I think, as many Africa watchers know, triggered protests, triggered demonstrations, and triggered the killings of people, and have disrupted the functioning of government. Um, we also have had the reemergence of what was called unconstitutional changes of government and militarily aided transitions. Um, for example, in Algeria, Egypt, Sudan, and Zimbabwe, um, military interventions continued in 2021 with Chad and Mali, and Unfortunately, um, we may be seeing more of this trend uh, uh, happening. So what do we do? Um, I think um, the first and most important point, which Marcia said, was that the U.S. has to itself address its own inequities and, and, and discrimination and the attempts to, to, to gut access to voting um, and, and democratic practice. If, and, and, and that is actually not only significant in, in, in what it could do in the United States, but it, would, it, it also has to be done, I think, to change this model from the 19th, from post-World War II period where the U.S. was, quote unquote, the model of democracy as opposed to the United States is an example of what is trying to be done, what is needed to be corrected, and what is needing to be learned. I think um, the uh, uh, Trump administration years shattered that model that this was the country to imitate. Um, and that, I think, is actually a, a step forward in terms of, of, of basically opening up the space for, for different variations and interpretations, but also for um, for, for us to get rid of the hypocrisy um, that do as we say and not as we do. <clears throat> the other uh, recommendation, I think, goes to this, the next uh, planned summit of democracies. Um, there has to be the inclusion as equal partners of civil society. Democracy and voting um, and rights cannot be and have never been shown to be um, protected adequately by governments and governments alone. And if they are not involved in this discussion about promoting democracy, then the United then, then the effort I think is is already going in at only 50% chance of success rates. Um, I think there's also got to be a fundamental and honest discussion about the disruptive role of security assistance and what it is what how it is having uh, a terrible impact on the rule of law and governance and rights and the ability to vote. And this is not just the counterterrorism security, but the, 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 the traditional military exchange of weapons um, and no questions asked, weapons, um, even though they've been used in abuses and funding of weapons um, and, uh, and, and a lack of transparency and accountability on the recipient side. Um, I think there's uh, finally, I, I've, I've uh, also already addressed the issue of, 
addressing voting issues here and discrimination in the United States. Um, I do think that civil society groups like this need to continue to build bridges between diaspora communities um, and Pan-African diaspora communities that may traditionally be hesitant and uncomfortable in engaging in quote unquote politics here in the United States. But that needs to be broken down because we learned what happens when the, the political machine goes off track um, with the election of Donald Trump. And if we're not careful, we'll have that again. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Misa. Thank you very much, Adote, for um, uh, so eloquently putting the, uh, the issues uh, in front of us uh, in terms of human rights and political freedom and, on, and also the issues of the, uh, the reversal of fundamental rights globally. And uh, now that we've, we only have four minutes, <laughs> unfortunately. So we, uh, unfortunately, I don't know how we, um, one thing I see echoing throughout has been um, throughout the, your three presentations, uh, uh, Reverend Chikani and uh, Attorney uh, Masia Johnson Blanco and uh, Adote Akwe, um, has been the hypocrisy within the, the whole international community about human rights and um, and how that plays into uh, uh, to how the rights are being eroded and also um, the uh, just the trend now as we see the threat to uh, to um, the voting rights and, and human rights globally but what since we know the problems can you give me each we have three minutes so, <laughs> uh, what can be done? On a local level, um, uh, Attorney Marcia Johnson Blanco, I can ask for that. And then also uh, Reverend Chikani on a regional level in the continent of Africa. And then Adote on in the human rights field it, with the organizations. So I'll start with uh, uh, Attorney Marcia Johnson Blanco. Thanks, Lisa. I would say. <clears throat> Organize, 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 as my um, partners would say. You know, we have to realize the fundamental that we're under and put together a plan for addressing it. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be multi-year, multi-decade long plan, but we can't continue with business as usual as we engage with our um, institutions because they're being threatened and, and it's not the same playing field. So we just need to organize for a, a fight, um, not just nationally, but with international partners as well. Because as we've been discussing, it's, it's a global challenge we're facing. Hey, Robert Chikani. My view has seen from the case study I pre present on South Africa. It's organized and organized, so I agree with, with you, ma'am. It's you can't do it otherwise. It's the people who must defend their democracies. And even on the African continent, the people on the ground stand and de defend their rights. Uh, they will be taken away. But at an international level, for me, it's the hypo it's a hypocrisy. Uh, that you can colonize people and still talk about democracy in your own countries. And, and everything in terms of national interest dictates what the powerful do in the world and even support dictatorships uh, in, in pursuit of their interests. And I think that's what we need to uncover and be clear about. We don't have time now. We could talk a lot about it. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Adote, you have less than 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, they said, I've already said organize. I think the other is um, solidarity building. Um, we need to share with each other what each other is doing and what each other is facing. That was one of the strongest things that came out of the anti-apartheid movement. And we have not been able to reppen. That's when we actually have the chance to win. Whoops. I'm over. Thank you, Musa. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. We could go on a few, uh, an hour or more with this conversation. I'm sorry we only have 45 minutes. And I uh, just want to thank uh, Attorney Masia Johnson Blanco, Reverend Frank Chikani, and Adote Akwe. And also want to thank Angelique uh, Walker Smith, uh, 
uh, for putting together this presentation and also wish, uh, sending out our prayers uh, to the family as they uh, going through the loss of their, their loved one. And that's why I'm t here as moderating today. I'm pinch hitting for her. So I hope um, I hope all of you enjoyed the session as much as I did and learned uh, some few things that we might not have known of um, as, as just like I did. And uh, I think this session will be recorded. So hopefully we'll get the information about where for the um, uh, for the recording. Thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. So we'll have to follow up with another conversation. <laughs> and this is